Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Amen. How many of you have heard that a single act of faith saves, or that salvation is like the dole when it's abused, that you get to sit at home and do nothing and get paid by the government to do nothing. These ideas, very popular as they are, are a grave misunderstanding of the gospel. And they will lead only to unholiness of life and, if unchecked, to hell itself. The Apostle Paul tells us here, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not become entangled again. Faith is not a singular act or inactivity. Faith is active. There is a liberty a life that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. And it is our duty to stand fast in that liberty by which Christ has made us free and not to become entangled again. The faith, the freedom that we have is one that is to be exercised and one that is to be guarded at all costs. And so that's the question before us. How is it that we can guard our liberty, guard our new life in Christ, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and make sure that we are not entangled again with a yoke of bondage? So how can we do this? Well, firstly, by making sure that you're resting in Christ alone. That's the first point. Make sure that you're resting in Christ alone. You'd think that resting is an easy thing to do. But actually, if you have sleep issues, you know that it can be a very hard thing to do. There are all kinds of competing distractions that keep you from the one thing you need, the actual sleep at night. And the same is true of Jesus Christ. There is a full rest, a true rest, a necessary rest to be found in Christ alone and nothing else will do. But there are countless distractions that would keep us from finding that rest in Jesus. Now in Galatia, it's been the push of the ceremonial law. And already the Galatians have, some of them, been observing days and months, festivals of the Jewish calendar, believing that that in some way will add to their status before God. And the great watershed moment for them is whether they receive circumcision or not. And this is not circumcision as something that is of cultural value, as it was to some of the Jews. But this is circumcision with the belief that it can secure, improve, 
or maintain our standing before God. The sentiment is expressed in Acts 15 and verse 1, that you must be circumcised according to the law of Moses if you are to be saved. So for the Galatians, it's the push of the ceremonial law. But for us, we're tempted to rest in other things. There is a pride that wells up within us as Christians. There is a pride in the character that God has developed within us by his spirit. And we begin to think that the kind of person that we are is surely something that keeps us from the judgment of God. God would never condemn us because of the way that we choose to live so different from the world outside. Pride wells up within our achievements. Achievements within the home. Look at the children that I've raised for God. I am a righteous man or woman. Pride swells up with the achievements that we've accomplished at work. Look at all of these things that I have done that set me apart from others. Maybe it's in our reputation. You're well thought of within the church and Christian community. Maybe well thought of in the community outside of the church. And you begin to think, well, there's something a bit special about me. And it's for this reason that I am loved by God. Or maybe you look to your faithfulness. Well, I'm loyal in attending the meetings of the church. I'm at prayer meeting every Wednesday. It's this that sets me apart from everybody else. But you know what the Apostle Paul says? That if you rest in one inch outside of Christ alone, you risk losing everything. I, Paul, say to you, verse 2, that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. If you are resting in your character, in your reputation, in your achievements, in your family, and you continue resting in those things... Though you think you have them in addition to Christ, he says, Christ will profit you nothing. He says it more strongly in verse 4. If you are seeking to be justified according to the works of the law, if you are seeking to be justified by anything that is in you, anything that you have done, circumcision or anything else, you have become estranged from Christ and you have fallen from grace. And you say, wow, that is an extreme position to take, Paul. But you understand that we have an extreme problem before God. As much as we need sleep at night, we need peace with God. God who is our maker. God who will be our judge and examine our lives. God who controls heaven and decides who can come into his heaven, the heaven that you all desire? But this God is intolerant to sin. He cannot stand it. Not a whiff of it, not a sniff of sin. And so if you want peace with God, then you have to bring perfection to the Lord. And so Paul warns in verse 3, I testify again to every man, who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. If you want to add something to your salvation, if you want to be measured by anything that you offer to God, then you better bring perfection. Absolute perfection. That's what God demands. Conformity. Perfect conformity to the whole law of God. Except that is impossible. How will you ever find peace with God? There is nothing you have ever done in your life that is perfect. Not one thing that is not marred by sin, by selfishness, by self-interest. All of your deeds are imperfect. 
And the great solution that Paul has been preaching and so keen to defend in this letter is that we have a perfection, not of our own, but a perfection that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 tells us, we by the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of a righteousness by faith. In Christ Jesus, circumcision or uncircumcision avail anything. There is a righteousness for us by faith in Jesus Christ. We said a man is not justified by the works of the law, Galatians 2.16, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. He, Galatians 4.4, 4, was made under the law to keep the law perfectly in the place of all of your imperfections. He, Galatians 3.13, has redeemed you from under the curse of the law, having become a curse himself, having been crucified for you. He is your perfection. And in him, if you are truly in him, your very best works and your very worst works in regard to your justification before God are meaningless. In Jesus Christ, circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything. They mean nothing before God. All that matters is his perfection, is his righteousness. But if we come and we seek to add one iota of ourselves as a thing that we are resting in, as a reason why God should accept us, do you know what we add? Intolerable imperfection. And if we continue resting in some intolerable imperfection before God, and we stand on the last day and that is our claim, he will chew you up and he will spit you out to eternal damnation. And yet, you know, we're so prone to it. And this is why he says, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. Do not become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Because this is our propensity. But you know what he's saying to them? Christ is enough. Christ is your confidence. Christ is your sweet rest. Don't seek rest outside of Christ. Don't believe that you can find rest in Christ while being distracted by some other confidence in your flesh. All of the rest that you desire, that you need, your peace before God is found in Jesus Christ. Are you resting in Christ alone? Well, here's a question. On what basis will God accept you into glory? If your answer is anything other than Jesus' work and righteousness, then you have become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And you need to repent of that and put your faith, rest in Christ and repeat this often because this is a struggle that you're going to wrestle with throughout your lives. As God is gracious, as his spirit works in you, as he does great things, your temptation is going to be to seek a confidence in the flesh. But always ask yourself that question. On what basis is God going to accept you into glory? And if the answer is anything other than Jesus and Jesus alone, then you have become entangled. Make sure you're resting in Christ alone. Second, hope in Christ. Where is your hope placed? Do you hope in what you possess? Do you hope in the past? Or do you hope in Jesus Christ? One of the great dangers of the faith is to divorce salvation from Jesus. And people do this when they look back to professions of faith, when they look back to their baptisms, when they look back to their confirmation in the church or coming into communicant membership. Now, all of those things can be helpful aids to faith, but that's not where your hope lies. Your hope lies, uh, your hope doesn't lie in attending some evangelical event in the past. 
Your hope doesn't lie in a sermon that you heard once. Your hope is not in something that you have received. Your hope, active hope and hoping is in a person. It's in Jesus Christ. That's where your hope is to be. So notice what he says in verse 5. That we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Do you hear that? Something future. We hope for the righteousness that is to come. The righteousness that is by faith. And you say, wait a minute, Paul, how can you say that? We are justified now. Now we have righteousness. And you know, that's a part truth. Paul says in Romans 5, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Having faith in Christ, we can say we are justified now through faith in Jesus Christ. And so how can he say that we are hoping for the righteousness that is by faith as though it is something future? Well, we are justified in Christ Jesus. And if you go to the verse before Romans 5.1, Romans 4.25... Paul says that Jesus was raised up from the grave because of our justification. Your justification is in Christ's justification. Death could not hold Jesus. Sin had been defeated. And Jesus was raised from the grave acceptable to God. And because of faith and union with Christ, you have your justification and your righteousness in Christ who is risen, and in Christ who is ascended. And right now, you know that you are justified in Christ by faith, but you don't see it. But you know one day, you will see it. Because just as Jesus was raised from the grave, you too will be raised up in glory. And there will be declared before all of the heavens and all of the earth, that sin could not hold you, that death could not hold you, that you have been raised up and accepted by God. You are justified in Jesus Christ, and yet it's a hope that you look forward to because your hope is always in Christ, not apart from Christ. Justification is not an object. It's not an event in your past life. Justification is a status that you have in a person. And you see, here's the Galatian problem. They think that they had Christ, and now they can play fast and loose by adding the law to their profession of faith. Now they can seek to be justified by the works of the law, as he says in verse 4. But this is to give up Christ. What happened in the past, if they are now hoping in something apart from Christ or something that once happened to them, will not help them. Past and passing hope will never do. Saving faith is a living hope in Jesus now. In Jesus always, and in Jesus forever. Do you hope in Christ? Is that where your hope is placed? Not an event, not an experience, not a profession of faith, but a person in whom you are justified. The same person who will return and raise you up in glory. Do you see that Paul's hope is not in what has happened? His hope is in Christ and what Christ will bring. His hope is in the righteousness that is to come by faith. Make sure that you are hoping in Jesus. That's what matters. It's not the date that you remember. 
in your calendar when you first put your faith in Jesus. In many ways, that date is absolutely meaningless if you are not hoping in Christ today. The salvation, the justification, the righteousness is through that living relationship with Jesus, that hope in him. And so Paul doesn't look back. He's not even looking to the present. He's looking to the future. His hope is always in Jesus and what Jesus will bring and in what Jesus will declare when he raises Paul from the dead and when he raises his people in glory. So make sure you're resting in Christ alone. Hope in Christ. And then my third and final point is this. Live in Christ. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So we're not going to rest in anything outside of Christ. We're not hoping in the past. We're hoping in Christ. But finally, what does it mean to stand fast in the liberty? How do we know that we are free and we're not slaves? How do we know that we're alive and that we're not dead? How do we know that we are resting in Christ and hoping in Christ? What does it mean to have freedom in Jesus? What does the freedom look like? Well, for the heretics here in Galatia, it meant living in external conformity to the ceremonial law. And Paul is saying that's got nothing to do with freedom in Christ. Again, circumcision or uncircumcision, they avail nothing in Christ. That's irrelevant. That's not a demonstration of your newfound freedom, of your newfound life, conformity to these ceremonial practices. And so how do you know? How are you to live this liberty? What does the liberty and freedom look like? What is your ethic? You see, the standard objection to the doctrine of grace is that it promotes sin. If Christ has done everything, then why should we do anything? Aren't we then free to live as we please, free to sin? Is that what he's saying? That you're free now. The law doesn't matter to you at all. There's no standard over your life. Just some ephemeral idea of love, some abstract concept. No, that's not what he's saying. And he refutes it in verse 21 when he says very, very firmly that if you live in sin, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not free to sin. But you know what you are free to do? You're free to love. Verse 6. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Faith unites us to Christ. It is by faith that we are resting in Christ and that we are hoping in Christ. But what are we free to do? What is our faith uh, doing for us in the present? What do our lives look like? Our faith is exercising itself. It's working its way out in love. That's how you see faith at work in your life, through love. Finally, through Christ, mankind is free to do that thing that he has never done. To love his God and to love his fellow man. This has been our problem from the very beginning. We have failed to love God. We've hated God. And we've failed to love each other. We have hated one another. But Christ has set us free. And we know we are free. We know we have faith in Christ because... Our faith works itself out in that thing that we could never do in love to God and in love to man. Now, how do we love? What does love look like? I said before, is it a loose and abstract concept? No, it's not. God defines love for us. And the summary of the law is given in verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you remember how the Lord Jesus Christ himself summarized the moral law of God. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
How do you love God? How do you love your fellow man? He tells us in that summary within the moral law of God. We love God by having no other God except him alone. We love God not by bowing down and worshipping images and idols, but worshipping him according to his holy word. We love God not by blaspheming his name, but by having reverence and fear within our hearts. We've been set free by Christ to do this. We love God by honouring his day, by giving to him a day in holy worship and, and praising him and thanking him for everything he's done. This is how we love God. Jesus tells us. The four command, first four commandments summarize it for us. How are you to love your fellow man? By showing honor to whom honor is due, honoring your father and mother. By having love and not hate in your heart. No bitterness or grief, thou shalt not murder. By having a pure heart, not a perverse heart that is caught up in sexual corruptions and perversities. Not by stealing, but by being generous to your fellow man. Not by lying anymore, but by being honest, being people of integrity, letting your yes be yes and your no be no. And not in seeking to take goodness from others, coveting with greed, but in desiring the good of others. This is how you love your fellow man. It's this that you could never do. And this is the liberty that Christ has brought you into. Not to sin, but to live unto God in righteousness, to love God and to love your fellow man. And not because you're motivated through fear of retribution as somebody under the law seeking to be justified by the law. Not in self-promotion or seeking your own salvation but in recognizing that Christ is your perfect offering before God. And so in love to God, in this new relationship that you have by the Spirit, now living to him in love, as he has defined it, as he has summarized it in his holy law. And you see, wherever you see love, as we've defined it, a hatred of sin, a right relationship with God. A right relationship with your fellow man. Striving for righteousness in the spirit of God. Wherever you see this love, you see the faith that is resting in Christ alone. You see the faith that is hoping in Christ alone. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has set you free. Love God. Love your fellow man. And do not become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Having any confidence in the flesh. Hoping in anything that is outside of Christ. Who is now seated at the right hand of God. Who is your righteousness. And remember that one day you'll see your righteousness when you are raised up in glory as Christ was raised in glory. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. Amen.